right, we're back looking at the life of uh, Elijah, and we've it's, it's hard to not preach the book and preach chapter by chapter and thought by thought, but I'm trying to just stay with the character of Elijah. So there's some places where he's not in the scene. So we've skipped a few chapters and uh, I'm not going to go back and recap and try to get up to speed, but we've been following this life of, of Elijah. I will go back to a few thoughts as they relate to, uh, to this uh, subject. So the title of the message is Ahab's Real Enemy. And of course, uh, I'm looking at verse 20 okay so first kings 21 look at verse 20 and here's where i get the title from it says and ahab said to elijah hast thou found me O my en mine enemy and he answered i have found thee because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the lord now i really wanted to preach a message on the idea of selling himself like being a sellout you know and, and all that and so well, Iola gets to hear that part of the message. <laughs> All right, so I've got a, uh, another message I'm preach uh, tonight about being sold out. But really what I wanted to focus on is I was thinking about this fact that he says, hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And, I, and as you just try to picture the scene and try to hear how he sounded when he said that, you could almost just see this nervous king, you know, stressed, troubled, uh, you know, people in leadership, tend to age quickly. Remember when, uh, I think I really saw it with Barack Obama. Remember he went in, looked like this really young guy when he came out, it's just like white hair and, and he's smoking. And <laughs> I think he smoked the whole time. I can't remember, but, but can you imagine like this at the, he's at the end of his reign, you know, this president or king or whatever you look at him, he's stressed out, smoking. And, and here comes this prophet of God up to him. And he's like, Oh, have you found me? <laughs> you found me. It's you again. You know, and this is what the relationship he had with Elijah. Elijah just pop up out of nowhere. In fact, the first time I read about him in the Bible, it's like, where did this guy come from? There he is. And, uh, and he's telling you, hey, it's not going to rain until, uh, you know, God, I give the word and, and God calls it to rain. And so what, a, what an interesting uh, relationship that Elijah had uh, with God, really. But then, uh, then to see him just go boldly before Ahab, that's quite something. But we all know this. Was Elijah really, I mean, he was an enemy I mean, in a manner of speaking, but it, just like I uh, preached another message earlier on in this series uh, about, you know, was Elijah a troublemaker? Well, from Ahaz's perspective and from maybe some other people in the land's perspective, he was a troublemaker. But who was really causing the trouble? And that's the that's kind of where I wanted to uh, to go with this. Who is Ahab's real enemy? Now, there's a strong indication here in the text and reading uh, other, you know, cross references and stuff, there's a strong indication that Ahab was actually saved. Now, this might surprise some people, but I really want to labor on this because this is going to be real important to how we uh, how we view the rest. I mean, it wouldn't change the message, but uh, it's really going to make the story more exciting whenever you think about it this way. <laughs> Just your thought about Ahab, and you're thinking about, you know, the worship of Baal. And all these things that he's doing, you know, and, and, and going against God's prophet and, and all these things you're thinking, there's no way he could be saved. Okay, but I want to uh, show you a couple things, you know, why I think that he's, he's saved. And then not only that, I want to show you a king that was even worse than him that I believe was saved. It doesn't mean everybody who was just born a Jew was saved, even in the Old Testament. That's not how it worked. Uh, but I'm going to show you that I, I believe that there's evidence that he was saved, which means obviously God would deal with him a little differently than he would deal with somebody who wasn't saved. And just so just let's pause just a second, just in case, just so everybody's on the same page. Okay. Now I, I'm not, there's different types of quote unquote dispensationalists out there. And I'm not of the mindset by any stretch of the imagination that people got saved in the old Testament in a totally different way than they got saved in the New Testament. You say, well, Jesus wasn't here. How could they get saved? Jesus wasn't here. Well, look, Jesus was preached to Abraham. He was preached, the Bible says, by, by Abel. You know, Now, his, obviously, they didn't know all the details, but they were preaching him. They were looking forward to him. Now, I don't know, uh, I don't know how God looked at that in the sense that they, they didn't understand. But even when Jesus was here, there were people who... Uh, who were waiting for the Messiah and they were putting their faith in, 
God. They were putting their faith in the Jesus that was to come. They didn't know his name was going to be Jesus, but the, the Messiah that was meant to come, the anointed one. And they were waiting for him. But when he got here, he had to reveal himself. And those who were his sheep followed him, right? That's what Jesus said. Those were, those were, were his sheep. So those ones who, who claimed to be children of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, who didn't follow Jesus, he says, you know, you're, you're of your father, the devil. They weren't because they, they never were really putting their faith in him. But if they would have put their faith in him and they would have been saved, I believe, when they saw Jesus and they knew who he was. And John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God will take away the sins of the world. They would have said, whoa, this is him. Maybe it would have taken him a day or two. I want to really think this through and, and, and talk to him and see. But the majority of them, I believe, just followed him because of their faith in God's plan and their faith in what God had revealed at that time. Hope that makes sense because there's a teaching out there that says, hey, Jesus wasn't here yet. So the, in the Old Testament, they were saved according to their works. And, and, and some people even go so far and say, in one day in the tribulation, they'll be saved according to their works again. And that's a weird, that's a weird view that somebody has kind of made and twisted that because they think that helps them interpret scripture, but it's really just a misunderstanding of other scriptures that seem to indicate that there's a emphasis on works, okay? So when we talk about people being saved in the Old Testament, sometimes it sounds strange, okay? But, uh, but what we mean is when they died, did they go to heaven or did they not go to heaven? And we see in the Bible there were both ways. How about Korah? Korah was obviously, Korah was uh, uh, one of Aaron's uh, you know, relatives. He was a priest. He was of the priest, the Kohathites, Kor whatever. He was of that lineage, and yet the ground opened up and swallowed him. He went straight down into hell, right? He wasn't saved. But there are others who die, and it says they went to go be with uh, their fathers and, and what have you. So let me show you 1 Kings 21. Uh, look at the end of this chapter, verse 29. This isn't a proof uh, because, you know, Un, unsaved people can humble themselves in a, in a sense after they're caught and after they're in trouble. But it says, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. So we see that there was a, a, a point where he humbled himself. And, uh, and, and so you would say, well, you know, is that the first time then that he ever humbled himself before the Lord? No. There were other times where he humbled himself as well. Uh, what about, and I'll get to this in a little bit, but what about when the prophets of Baal were all murdered? Because Elijah, you know, he did the sacrifice and God brought fire down from that. It seems to me like Ahab, you know, was like, hey, he is the God, all right? You, we've proved this. And then, of course, Jezebel gets in the mix, which I'll talk about here in a minute. All right, so, uh, so let me talk about this. Um, later on, uh, we are going to see, look at 2 Kings 21. I mean, not in this series, but if you're reading the Bible through, later on you'll come across the story of Manasseh. 2 Kings 23. Or actually, start with 2 Kings 21. Second Kings 21, look at verse 10. And the Lord spake by his servants, servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem a line of uh, Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside, uh, upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to their enemies because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much, 
till he had filled Jerusalem from one end of another, besides his sin, wherewith uh, he made Judah to sin, in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did, and his sin that he sinned, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And we'll look at Chronicles here in a minute. But this is the first story where we see about Manasseh, and we see how wicked he was, shed innocent blood, there was some kind of idolatry involved, involved. and in fact, his sins that are so wicked become the cause of, you know, everything we read that Jeremiah prophesies and then we see in Ezekiel where, you know, Babylonian Empire takes over and takes them into captivity. And really Israel never becomes a nation again or, or Judah never becomes a nation again. They go back into the land under Zerubbabel, but they never really become that nation. They're always under somebody else. The Roman Empire is, uh, you know, ends up being over them, and, and really they won't be an empire again until the millennial kingdom. So, uh, so that was some serious sin. He's like, hey, all of this is because of the sins of Manasseh. Look at 2 Kings 23. Now this is a, one of my favorite stories here. Uh, favorite kings, Josiah. Right, and, and he's actually trying to clean things up. And it says, verse 24, Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits, and the wizards, and the images, and the idols, and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law, which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And like unto him was there no king before him uh, that turned to the Lord with all his heart, and with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. And so basically what you see is this king comes in, he's repentant, he's like, hey, we're going to turn things back right. We are going to tear down all the idols kick out all the wizards, you know, kick out the sodomites. I mean, he just cleans up the land. He gets rid of all the evil. Uh, even his own, I'm, I think I'm talking about the right guy, even his own mother who was like his uh, advisor, right? He even like kicks her out of office. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, I'm just going to, I'm going to set these things right because I want the favor of God. And then God says, basically, you know, well done. You're doing a good job, but I'm still going to have to, you know, pour out my judgment and my wrath upon the nation, right? But I'm going to wait till after you're, after you're gone. And isn't that what he said about Ahab when you read in the text? He says, okay, because Ahab repented, you know, I'm not going to bring all this judgment in his day, but the judgment is still coming. Now, I mentioned this this morning in Iola, totally unrelated, but I mentioned uh, what we would call Calvinism or like a predeterminist view, like where you, they, people think that God already has everything spelled out and determined. And, and because he's a sovereign God is the word that they always use, even though sovereign is not in the Bible in that way. Now, we do believe he's sovereign in the sense that he's the final authority and all that. But, uh, but this mindset that, hey, whatever he wants to be done is just going to be done. And we don't really have any free will because who are we to tell God what to do? Like that might make sense to you. But the fact of the matter is the Bible teaches that God gave us a free will and there's no getting around that. And so over and over, we even see all throughout the Bible, and this is the main thing I was talking about, that God changes his mind. Now, God is immovable, right? God is unchangeable in a sense. His character, his personality, he's unchangeable. Changing. However, he allows that if man will change his behavior, and they'll get a hold of God, then God will change what he was going to do. And, uh, and, it's, and it's really interesting to see how many times that happens in the Bible. You'll see a man like Moses, you know, God's going to wipe everybody out. And Moses says, you know, Lord, don't do that. And God will actually listen to Moses and change his action a little bit. Sometimes it's delaying the time because they still get punished, right? Sometimes it's, uh, hey, I'll wait till after you're gone and then. Do it or, or, or whatever. Or sometimes it's a less of a sentence, you know. I was just listening to uh, Pastor Anderson actually was preaching on uh, on uh, uh, Ezekiel, and he was talking about Ezekiel bread. Anybody remember the story about the Ezekiel bread and, and how he wanted them to cook it with, with human dung? 
And, Eli and, and, and Ezekiel is like, oh, Lord, no, ah, Lord. And so he actually says, okay, I'll let you use cow dung. <laughs> God, sorry, that doesn't sound like much, it's much better, but <laughs> he changed God's mind and God said, okay, I'll change a little bit. I'll, and several times in the Bible, he does that. Now, that doesn't minimize God's behavior. That just says God, you know, has created us, us in such a way and given us free will in such a way that he will change. Now, you say, well, I don't understand how that happens because God already knows everything that's going to happen in the future. That's exactly right. See, here's the problem that we can't comprehend is God is past, present, and future. And so he exists in the future. He knows what's going to happen in the future, but he deals with us and what we see in his actions happens right now. Right? So whenever I change something, well, then he changes what he was going to do, even though he knows what ends up in, in, in the future. Okay, And if that blows your mind, well, then just welcome to theology <laughs> and biblical doctrine, because it is hard to comprehend these things. But don't let anybody tell you that you can't change God's mind on something. You know, Now, let me put a little preface on that. Be careful, because it could be that what you're praying to God and trying to you know, so you always have the attitude, never, I will be done, <laughs> because you don't want to try to get him to give you uh, something that is going to be bad for you. OK, so. Uh, so anyway, so what we find here is that Josiah is saying, you know, hey, I'm going to turn this kingdom right. I'm going to be a good king. And he does a good job. But God says, no, the wickedness of Manasseh was so bad and all the things that he brought have perverted the people so much that I've still, got, I've still got to carry this out. I've still got to do everything uh, that I plan on doing, but I'll wait till after you uh, are gone and it'll be in your, son's, in your son's reign that this will happen. Okay, uh, look at, however, uh, 2 Chronicles 33. Now, remember at the end of his life, it says he died, and then it says, and the rest of these... The rest of, his, of, of, of these things, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? Okay, so let's look at the Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 33. I'll get back to Elijah here in a minute. 2 Chronicles 33, look at verse 10. So I love this about, let me try not to derail too far, but one more, one more thing. I love this about the Bible. I love so many things about the Bible, but one of the things I love about the Bible is that so many places in the Bible, God gives us more than one view of what happened, okay? And the greatest example of this is the Gospels, right? So there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's not like they copied each other. It's not like they all, you know, uh, are just trying to write down the same things that they've all heard. Like they're giving eyewitness views, but they're telling it from their perspective perspective using their personality their you know style and all that so when you read Matthew you get one view and then when you read Mark it's not like you get a view that contradicts but you get a different view that allows you to see some things that you didn't see whenever you read Matthew and the genius about that is it actually shows the legitimacy of everything that happened because of the fact that if everybody just Said, told the exact same story, you'd say, well, they conspired together and they just shared each other's work. But that's not what happened. And so in the court of law, if you get some eyewitnesses up there and you got four different stories and they all generally say the same thing, but they're adding different uh, uh, details in there because their perspective was slightly different than the other guy's perspective, then you know for sure that these people are telling the truth and they didn't conspire together to tell some kind of lie. And this is exactly what we have throughout the Bible. So God gives us the king's you know, I mean, he does this even in Genesis. He gives us like a story and then he gives us like another account that kind of gives us a different perspective of creation. And then he gives us uh, in the Kings, then we have the Chronicles that backs that up, you know, and then, uh, you know, all throughout the Bible, we got that. We've got that in, uh, in obviously, like I mentioned, the Gospels. We got that in uh, Revelation, Revelation 1 through 12. And then you read you know, 13 through 22, and you're basically reading some of the same things over from a different perspective. And so that's a beautiful thing about the Bible. You can read the Bible, and it's not like one man sat down and wrote this from his mind, but you've got all these eyewitnesses, and they all fit right together, and it's perfect. Uh, uh, God, God knew what he was doing, obviously. All right, so uh, where was I going with all that? So Chronicles. We're in now Second Chronicles chapter 33, and here is a second story about Manasseh. 
Now, the first time, we don't see anything about Manasseh getting right or nothing that would indicate that he was a believer. Um, but in uh, 2 Chronicles 33, sorry, I know you're already there. Starting in verse 10, it says, And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the kings of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to, ba to ba uh, Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. Notice it said he besought the Lord his God. Now, you ought to, bes <laughs> you ought to be... Be how do you say that? You ought to seek him. <laughs> I'll just say it that way. Because if he's your God, boy, you have really brought, brought a lot of shame and embarrassment to your God from all the wickedness he's done. But now here he is in affliction, trial, tribulation. That's what the message was this morning from the book of James. Uh, and all of these things that were brought upon him, he says, okay, God's trying to get my attention. And so he besought uh, the Lord. And humbled himself greatly before God, the, the God of his fathers, and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Now, this is the end of Manasseh's life. Obviously, God still judges, pours out his judgment, and he still has to... You know, punish not just Manasseh, but all the people that followed in Manasseh's ways. But Manasseh, we see he showed some humility and he besought his God, realizing, hey, I've done some, some stupid things. Now, some people say, well, yeah, but he went so far as to go back to idolatry. And you could write that off and say, well, that was in the Old Testament. God winked at, the, you know, back then he winked at it and now he commandeth all men to repent, right? But really, it's, it's if you think about it, there are a lot of stories where people, I mean, all throughout the Old Testament, really, but uh, where people went to idolatry. And when we were talking about the different nations of the world and, and uh, uh, part of like Asia and, and Africa and places like that where, they, where there's idolatry, I talked about how, how it's really easy for people who are believers to even fall back in some of that and have kind of like good luck charms and stuff like that. Now, look, if anybody's trusting in their idol or a false god or something to get them to heaven, they're not saved, obviously. Okay. But could somebody be saved about Solomon? I mean, Solomon, you know, building the altars to all of his thousand wives' god. You know, what about Rachel, Jacob's wife, who, who steals her dad's idol because she thinks it's going to bring good luck or something like that? And, uh, and I know, again, that's Old Testament, but how about this? How about Second John or... Uh, uh, yeah, Second John, he says, hey, keep yourselves from idols. Well, why would he be telling believers that? Because it's real easy for believers to fall back into having some kind of idol. And we could, you know, preach a whole sermon on what an idol could be. Uh, but the fact is, even a saved person can get so wicked where it looks like they don't even believe anymore or something like that. That's, where I, that's what I believe on that. Okay, and so I said all that. That's a long introduction about how I believe that Ahab was probably a saved person. But the reason I say that is because that makes this whole story more interesting. When you consider that God's not just coming to Ahab to say, hey, I'm going to punish you because you're wicked. He's coming to him as, a chi as his child who's just way backslidden and way rebellion and has done all this wickedness. And he's coming to him in that way, if what I'm saying is correct about him being saved. So when Elijah comes on the scene and he stands before Ahab and Ahab's like, oh, my enemy, <laughs> right? Was Elijah really Ahab's enemy? What was Elijah coming to do? Was he going to fight him? Was he going to, you know, not listen to him and not have it? No, Elijah was simply carrying the message from God. And he's telling him, you need, to, you need uh, to get right. This is what the prophets would do. They're just speaking, thus saith the Lord, and hoping that they could bring them back to, uh, to the truth. Now, again, people like Saul, King Saul, people like Solomon, uh, even David himself, there are times where at the end of their lives, they fell so far away that it's just, it's just so hard to imagine. And in their falling away from God, look, they brought a lot of shame upon their people. They marred their name. They brought all kinds of bad things in their life. Uh, no doubt lost many rewards that they could have had in heaven. Um, there's a lot of, 
you know, repercussions that they're going to have from their. So it's not like, hey, just live however wicked you want, do whatever, and you're still going to be blessed by God. No, the opposite is true. God's not going to let you get away with it. And in the end, everybody's going to be rewarded according to their works. Now, if you didn't do anything for the Lord or on this earth, you did negative things toward the Lord. Don't expect rewards when you get to heaven. You know, and I don't know what those look like exactly, but uh, but this is the the point that I'm trying to make. Number one is Elijah was not Ahab's enemy. Now, in a way, he was an enemy at the time uh, because of Ahab's choices. But Elijah was not his enemy. So God sending Elijah to Ahab was actually to chastise him. Right. I'm giving you a chance to get right because what you're doing is wrong. This isn't the first time he did that. Go back to 1 Kings 18. First Kings 18, look at verse 17. And I mentioned this verse earlier, but it says, And it came to pass that Ahab saw Elijah. And remember, this is a time of drought. There's no rain because of the fact that Elijah prayed and God shut up the rains from coming. And so now there's this big drought and everybody knows because Elijah told Ahab that, that this was going to happen because of Ahab's sin. And so now Ahab is standing in front of him. He says, art thou he that troubleth Israel? So Ahab's, ask, Ahab's telling Elijah, are you the one that trouble, is trouble, troubling Israel? Look, Ahab was the one that was troubling Israel. All Elijah was doing is trying to get him back right with God so that he didn't have to do that. Okay, remember uh, when all the false prophets were slaughtered, ver uh, chapter 18, verse 39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape, and they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So he proved that God was the God, the God. And he said, "Like We're going to kill all the false prophets. We're going to slay them. And now it's like almost like sending Ahab on his way to say, Now you're back right with the Lord. You got the wickedness out of the way. Now go right, lead the nation, do right. But what's he do? He goes home and he goes to Jezebel and he says, let me tell you what happened. The 400 prophets of Baal, they all got, who knows how he told the story. Like I always wonder, like, did he come actually kind of excited? Like, hey, you know what happened? It starts telling the story about how Elijah put the sacrifice on the altar. And look, there was, a, he poured water on it and all this kind of stuff. Nobody had fire. And then fire just came down from heaven and God consumed it. And he's looking at Jezebel's face going like, she's not liking this. And Jezebel's like, God, do the gods do so more to me if I if, if Elijah's not dead tomorrow, however she says it. So he goes to Jezebel, and Jezebel seems to redirect Ahab. Now, this is something that seems to be a common problem for people in the Bible. And I'm going to talk about this tonight on the message about being sold out. Sometimes people are sold out to women, <laughs> men that are sold out to women. Let me just throw this out there real quick. Okay, so here's, here's the Bible. It starts with Adam and Eve, right? Adam is not deceived. Eve is deceived. And she says, you know, I know we're not supposed to do it, but why don't you eat of this fruit too? It didn't kill me. And he's like, okay, <laughs> just do what the woman says, right? You read a little bit farther, the sons of God take the daughters of men. Now, there's different interpretations of that. I don't believe that you need to make this some kind of angelic, some uh, uh, giants in the land, or all these things that have interpreted into this uh, text. I think the sons of God are believers. Okay, so, and if you read the context and you follow from the, the, the narrative from the very beginning of Genesis, what you see are these people who are calling on God, following God, and then all of a sudden these sons of men... I mean, these sons of God, excuse me, because they're spiritually born again, right? The sons of God. And they're looking at the daughters of men who are just worldly women, you know, not interested in the Lord. And they're turned away from following God and they're turned after them. And so then there's all this wickedness in the land and all that stuff. 
you keep reading in the Bible, you come, I'm, I'm probably skipping a lot of stories, but you come to Samson and Delilah. Boy, wasn't, you know, Delilah his downfall. And, uh, and then you see David and Bathsheba. You see Solomon. He went after many strange women, the Bible said. And strange there just means foreign. I mean, I'm not going to say out of those thousand there weren't any, like, strange ones. But, but uh, a strange woman just means there were foreign women. But all, with all these foreigners came foreign gods. And so he said, well, you know what? I love these women, and so I might as well appease them. And so he built the altars and all that kind, kind of stuff. And so, uh, and so it seems to be that a lot of times men will, you know, be led and, uh, and fall away by the woman. So that leads me to my second point. All right. We discovered that Elijah was not really Ahab's enemy. He was just trying to bring him, you know, news that would save him. How about Jezebel? Was Jezebel uh, Ahab's enemy? Now, every time it seems like after this story, well, let's just look at 19 verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. You see what I'm saying? For all we know, he might have been excited about it. Hey, you never believe what happened. But by the time he gets done telling the story, then Jezebel sent a messenger into Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So uh, then she pursues Elijah. Look, at, uh, look back to chapter 16, and I want to show you this, that Ahab was never supposed to marry Jezebel to begin with. 1 Kings 16, verse 30. And again, this matches up with that whole thing about the sons of God and the daughters of, of men. The Bible's always been clear that those who are God's children are not supposed to intermingle with unbelievers. Okay, the, You don't want to be unequally yoked. And so that makes a lot of common sense, but isn't it interesting how many times you knock on someone's door and they're like, oh yeah, I'm a believer. I was saved when I was such and such years old. And they're like, oh, well, they go to the Catholic church or like they're not, they don't really, you know, believe in God. They're atheists. And, and I've met all this and I'm thinking, wow, if you were saved as a kid, how in the world did you ever get in a relationship with someone who doesn't believe like you believe, <laughs> doesn't believe in the Lord? I don't understand how that happens. Well, I do understand how that happens, but, uh, but you can see why God said don't do that. Look at chapter 16, verse 30 and uh, read through 33. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took a wife, Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So it's like, you know, if God wasn't mad enough at his wickedness, he went to one of the pagan women, the, uh, the, the followers of Baal, and he hooked up with her. And so that made God mad. So he wasn't supposed to do that to begin with. And now every time it seems like he has an opportunity to turn from his sin, Elijah does a pretty good job turning him. Uh, you know, later on in 2 uh, Kings, uh, I believe it's in 2 Kings, Micaiah is a prophet that's on the scene. And Ahab's like, oh, there's, this, there's one other prophet, but I, I don't like him. He never prophesies good concerning me, but only evil. And so like, he's trying everything he can to do, do to, to, to get away from them. But every time he has an opportunity to do right and, and to get back right. And okay, now I'm on the right path. Jezebel's there to push him back into, uh, into the sin. So it would stand a reason that you would say, okay, well then Jezebel is actually who his enemy is. Like he would have been, you know, actually Elijah came and he said the right things and he showed that God is the God. And so actually Elijah was his friend, but then, you know, Jezebel brought him back. So Jezebel was his enemy, right? <clears throat> Only problem with that is, like I said, he shouldn't have been with her to begin with. And, uh, and, 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 and God was the one who was bringing all this evil upon him because of his sins. And so you can't really blame Jezebel. You have to blame the fact that he did the things that he did. Okay, so what well, does that make God Ahab's enemy? Well, again, like I said uh, about sending Elijah, God is dealing with Ahab, believe it or not, as, as strange as it may sound, he's dealing with him as a son, albeit a very 
rebellious and backslidden son, but he's dealing with, them, with him as a son. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. I meant for this to be more of a of a preaching service, but I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm more trying to teach you guys, but that's all right. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So the idea there is like, hey, if God just let you go into your sin and just, you know, didn't care about you, gave you over to a reprobate mind, you know, he just let you go in your own way, then obviously you weren't his son but or daughter or whatever the case may be. But if he's continually seeking you out and he's sending the punishment and he's sending the, sending the chastisement and he's dealing with you and you're just like, oh, would you leave me alone? So, so you see the frustration. Ahab's like, oh, are you my enemy? Have you found me my enemy? Well, it wasn't really Elijah who was his enemy, right? And his wife is there, you know, talking him into doing all these things and going and, and going back into sin. You can say she's the enemy. No, she's not really the enemy. Was God the enemy? No, God's a loving father that just wants his child to do right. God's not the enemy. So who's the enemy? And I think it's probably easy for everybody to probably already figure this out. Ahab was Ahab's enemy. Now, here's the problem. We all, in our life, we could point the blame to people and say, hey, that person made me do it. That person's the enemy. That person is wicked. That person hates me. That person, we can throw the blame out there for everything wrong that happens in our life. Or we could just say, you know what? It's no one else's fault. God just did this. God's my enemy. Why does God hate me? Why does God let these things happen? You know, there's people that are bold enough to say that. But at the end of the day, we are the ones who determine our relationship with God. We are the ones that have the, uh, the ability to say, no, I'm not going to listen to the world. No, I'm not going to listen to these influences in my life. No, I'm not going to give in to this pressure. I'm going to follow God, you see. So we are the ones who have the opportunity to be at enmity with God or not, but, but it's because of us. It's not because uh, he's just naturally our enemy and wants to destroy us. Look at uh, uh, James 4 and we'll be done. Didn't have this in my notes, but I feel like this is a good place to, to stop. James chapter 4. Let's just read from the first one. From whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence, even of your, lu uh, of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and ye cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask a mist that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Resist, uh, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your heart, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. We'll just stop right there. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for continually, continuously seeking us out as your children and uh, providing the chastening that we need. Help us to love uh, the chastening and to uh, rejoice, or even as James says, uh, count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations and, and help us understand, Lord, that you're doing it for our own good and for your glory. And as Christians, as believers, Lord, help us to want that first and foremost in our lives, that you be glorified and you be honored and help us to, uh, to walk right with you. Help us not to backslide or be uh, uh, rebellious children. 
And Lord, I pray that when uh, God sends an Elijah or Micaiah or some prophet of God our way to preach the Bible and accuse us of our, uh, show us our sins and accuse us of, uh, of, of rebelling against you, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to accept it, rejoice in it, and be thankful that it brings us back to you, which gives us such a better life and such peace and joy in our hearts. Uh, Lord, that would be my prayer for everybody here and that we would seek your wisdom and uh, seek the peace of God that passeth all understanding. I pray uh, for the rest of this service and for the trip uh, back home that you keep us safe. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.